Well, we have a lot of people that have been um, very excited to have you on because there's been so many questions. Um, you know, it's been quite a while now. The vaccine's been out for some time and, um, I, and you're the, the, the global expert. So um, I have a lot of questions and let's get straight into it. The first question is, vaccine's been out for some time. Is it safe? My shortest possible answer would be yes, of course. And just to reassure our viewers and listeners, look, before the vaccine gets started, we put it through the laboratory, the Petri dish models. Then we move it to uh, primate animal models. Then we move it to smaller number of humans in the phase one trials. Then we increase the numbers to larger numbers in phase two and three. And then finally, we get this data looked at by independent scrutineers. And then we look, look, and look again. So by the time a vaccine has been licensed, it has gone through many tests and checks. And then it finally gets independent license that it is safe to be given to all the people who are otherwise fit and healthy. We don't want to give them something that may harm them, considering these are fit and healthy people. And one more thing, finally, we also monitor people after we have started to give them the vaccines. So post-vaccine surveillance also continues to make sure that there is no unknown, unknown, unexpected uh, outcomes of having had the vaccine. I think the concern that a lot of people have is the fact that this vaccine came out so fast. Um, you know, most vaccines take several years uh, to be monitored and trials. Um, what's your take on that? So the reason why not only vaccines, but medicines take decades to finally come to the market is that inertia. The inertia is the thought, the idea, then working it in the lab, and then uh, recruiting people to test it on and then progressing that experiment and so on. And all these hurdles take time. You have to get all these ethical board approvals, permissions, etc. And finally, you've also got to find the people to try this new experiment on. Uh, and with respect to the vaccines, because it was a global emergency, several things happened. One, it was almost like a bottomless pit of money. So a lot of money was made available to the pharmaceutical companies. Secondly, it was done with earnest and resolve, which was, we're going to do this. We're going to fund you to do it. We're going to make available the volunteers. We're going to be able to do it in record time by opening up all those gates for you. So what was not done <clears throat> was cutting of corners. No corners were cut. We would never cut corners just because we wanted to get something to market quickly. So in answer to your question, Sheila, the answer is, please don't worry that we managed to get a vaccine within one year. The reason why we got it within one year is all those restrictive gates, the bottlenecks, the restrictions, the slowing down processes were removed and a lot of money was poured into the system to make it happen sooner. And that's why we've got the vaccines in less than a year. So that makes a lot more sense. What you're saying is something that would have taken several years with the, the amount of people that had the, the vaccine and the, uh, the money that was putting it, it was able to be done a lot in a shorter time. That is correct, yes. So the other, th the concern is also, now this is a different kind of vaccine, right? Most of the vaccines can either be uh, like AstraZeneca, which is like a live attenuated vaccine but we've got this mRNA vaccine. And obviously for a lot of people that aren't in the medical field, just the word mRNA sounds scary because we associate it with DNA and then with DNA, we're thinking, is, there, is, is it gonna change our DNA? Is something gonna happen? I mean, I've, I've, I've been on a lot of forums. A lot of my patients ask me a lot of questions. You know, they're worried about long-term effects of this new vaccine because it's, it's not been around before. Are they gonna have issues with um, autoimmunity, uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Can you address that, doctor? My pleasure, absolute pleasure. And really, I want uh, our viewers and listeners to celebrate. This is a huge celebration for science. And um, uh, if I could turn back, I want to be 
20 years old again so that I can join in with this medical revolution. So what this revolution means is as follows. Let me take you through the journey. It really is beautiful. So the Astra, start again. So the Pfizer Moderna uh, vaccines are based on a nanoparticle technology. And we really must salute the engineers. Engineering is also important in science and medicine. <clears throat> we salute the engineers who can make the machinery to make the nanoparticles. So what we have is a molecule of mRNA and I'll explain the mRNA bit in a minute. So we have a tiny, tiny, tiny molecule of mRNA, which is then coated with a lipid envelope. And that lipid envelope coated molecule of mRNA is tiny, it's 10 to the minus nine. It's a nanoparticle. And that nan nanoparticle is stabilized in your vaccine. And it's also augmented, meaning uh, there's other bits put in, uh, uh, other chemicals to enhance the immune response. And that is the injection that we give you with the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccines. And when we give you that injection, those nanoparticles basically get into your cell. They only get into your cell, not your nucleus, just the cell. Having got into your cell, because it's so tiny, 10 to the minus nine, the lipid membrane is dissolved in the cytoplasm of your cell. And then it releases the molecule of mRNA. That released molecule of mRNA finds what we call a factory in your cell. That factory, we call it a ribosome. So when the mRNA interacts with your ribosome, the ribosome has only one job. It does the job that the mRNA tells it to do. So this mRNA, which we have injected into you through the lipid envelope, uh, tells the ribosome, make me some spike proteins. And it makes you the SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike protein. And having made this spike protein, these spike proteins are expressed, meaning pushed out onto the surface of the cell membrane. And your body's immune system then recognizes these spike proteins and says, hello, you don't belong here. You don't belong to my, my body here. You are an alien. You are not supposed to be here. So the immune system recognizes it and attacks it and makes antibodies to attack it. And it also makes immune memory. This way, the vaccine works by making your body make the spike protein and your body's immune system recognizes the spike protein and makes immune memory. And it makes immune memory two ways. One we call T cell immunity, so that's cellular immunity. And the other one is B cell immunity, which is the arm that makes antibodies. So, so that's the immune and immunity process for the Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech vaccines. Now then, if we move on to the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccines and the Sputnik V Russian vaccine, they are also similar, but a different platform. The different platform is as follows. They attach the molecule of the mRNA, that's the instruction molecule, that's the sequence that the sequence in that molecule that we want it to do the work that it does when it meets the ribosome. That molecule is attached to a virus this time. <clears throat> the virus in the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine is a chimpanzee virus, chimpanzee common cold virus. And what happens is you, you inject it the virus has been denatured. So all that the virus does is it's injected into your arm and from your arm, it makes the journey into your cell. Once it's made its journey into the cell, it does nothing more. It can't reproduce, it can't multiply, it can't do anything. It just makes the crossing. Having made the crossing, 
it releases the mRNA molecule. That mRNA molecule interacts with the ribosomes and it makes the spike protein. Now then, to answer your questions about DNA and mRNA and all that. So mRNA is mRNA. It's called messenger ribonucleic acid. That messenger RNA cannot turn around and start making DNA. Okay, it only makes the protein that it has been instructed to make. It does not interact with your nucleus. It doesn't go anywhere near your nucleus. So it doesn't have any interference with your personal DNA. It has nothing to do with it. So it is uh, short-lived. It gets denatured very quickly and it does what it's meant to do. Instruct your ribosomes in your cells to make spike protein, no more, no less. So those are the main vaccines. If I may add, just taking up a little bit more time for completeness, there are other vaccines. So for example, there is Novavax. Novavax is a new vaccine that's uh, not yet licensed, but we expect it will be successful in being licensed. Is So the, the clever people at Novavax make the spike protein in the laboratory. So they make the spike protein in the laboratory by bioengineering methods and inject the spike protein under your, under your skin into your, your muscles. So that's one example. Then there is another example. The uh, Sinopharm, the Chinese vaccine, uses killed vaccine. So it is a, uh, a, a bits and pieces of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's killed. It's killed, it's not alive. So it doesn't cause you a, a, a disease. It's just um, arouses immune responses and then you become immune to that infection. So that's how these vaccines, different platforms, different technologies, all coming together to save planet Earth from SARS-CoV-2. So that my optimism coming a full circle now about why I would like to be 20 years again is these vaccines will also be useful for other diseases. They will either also form vaccines against things that we have not succeeded so far. Malaria, dengue, a better TB vaccine, um, and also better bespoke uh, treatments for cancers and so on, and protein deficiency, genetic disorders, etc. So we expect lots of developments from these new platform of vaccines. Sorry, I took up so much time. No, I think that's really important to clarify because so many people are just concerned about it being new, new technology. But that that study of the mRNA vaccine has that been is that a new thing or has that been many many years and we're just kind of hearing about it recently? So the uh, no, we've <laughs> we've been trying with these mRNAs for a long time, and uh, we never quite succeeded in um, getting the mRNA the instructions uh, into the cells. Uh, consistently, persistently, successfully all the time until we tried this um, using the carrier, the virus to take it into the cell. That's the AstraZeneca Sputnik one or you coating it in lipid biofilm and making it into a nanoparticle and then getting it across. Now we have succeeded and having succeeded, we can do other things. So it has been around a long time. It's not so brand new that we should be concerned about these things in the future. No, not at all. Now, you do mention that this, um, this, the virus that is, that's out there is the spike protein. It's got a lot of spike protein. Now, I'm hearing that it's, things are changing. Is the spike part of the protein changing? Or, and, and the reason I ask that question is, are these vaccines going to be effective uh, for the new variants that are coming out? Yeah, it's a very good and important question, Sheila. So I'm pleased that you're asking it. Uh, let me digress and take our viewers and listeners through it. So these viruses are RNA viruses, ribonucleic acid viruses, and they change and make mistakes. That's the thing. 
So when they multiply, meaning when they reproduce, when they are reproducing, they haven't got good checking systems. So they make mistakes. And those mistakes are what we call mutations. So they make these mistakes throughout its RNA. It's not only here, 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 but we are interested in the critical areas of the virus where the mistakes are made. So the critical areas are where the virus attaches itself to the human cell. So that is a critical area. So imagine this, if there was a mutation, such a severe mutation that it found it difficult to attach to the human ACE2 receptor. In that case, it would be end game, the end, because the virus now no longer can infect human beings. That's one outcome. So on the other hand, the mutation, meaning the reproduction mistake, may be such that, it's all random chances, by the way, it's, uh, it's random chances and, uh, and selection as well. So it's a combination of two. It's selection pressures and random chances. I'll address what selection pressures mean in a minute. So if on the other hand, uh, a virus is making reproduction mistakes and the mistake happens to be a very good fit for a human receptor. In other words, the key that goes into the lock now goes in smooth, slick, smooth, smooth as ever, you know, silicon grease greased, uh, lubricated, and it, and it goes into the lock and it smoothly opens the lock. So that's the same analogy. If that mutation is that it attaches to the human cells better and can infect you better, then of course we are concerned because now we have a virus that has become easier to infect you because it finds your ACE receptor a beautiful, a better, a more easier, more, uh, more excellent fit. And this is the variants we're talking about. So the variants have evolved. The one in the UK is, has evolved to be more infectious, not more disease causing, not more severe disease causing, but it finds it easy to infect you. And because it finds it easy to infect you, one, number two, it infects the upper respiratory tra tract, back of throat, upper area here. And number three, it releases as a result of two, meaning upper respiratory uh, area, it releases a lot more virus particles. So if you are standing next to somebody who is infectious, before they would be releasing, say hypothetically, tens of hundreds of thousands of virus particles. But in this case, with the new variant, they're releasing millions and millions of these particles. So if there are millions of them being released, it's easier to get caught by a larger number of virus particles and therefore get infected by it. So the reason why we've seen a spike in number of cases is a more infectious strain and now, not, I mustn't use the word strain, more infectious variant. More infectious variants from different parts of the world have arrived and they've made the case numbers go up. Final, one more bit, and then I will pause for a breath. So um, we are also interested in the biological structure of the spike protein. So when the mistakes of reproduction happen, the spike protein also changes shape. That's the biological structure. Now, if the shape change is significant enough, and remember we're dealing with shapes. So if the shape is like this, and then it becomes like this, if the shape is significant enough, the antibodies that you got from immunization may not work against the new shape. And if they don't work against the new shape of the spike protein, then you've got reduced immunity against this new shape. And that is the headache we're dealing with at the moment. So the answer is 
that some of the vaccines, the AstraZeneca people have already said it, that maybe they're less efficient at eliminating or tackling the infection from the South African variant of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, we need to be careful about not allowing such variants to emerge so that it negates and nullifies the heroic efforts of developing the vaccines and vaccinating millions of people. I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, so the concern is the, um, the shape changing basically, but so far is the shape changing that much or are we still, does it seem like it's gonna be okay with the vaccine? So the answer is uh, we are very watchful so the shape change for the South African variant appears to be of concern in that the AstraZeneca uh, group have said that it is not as effective as it could be, should be. So we are concerned. I'm not saying that the vaccine's effects are now nullified, zero. What I'm saying is if it was in the past 85, 90% effective, it is probably now 60, 70% effective in eliminating it. So it is able to eliminate it, but not as well as it could do. So even if you had the vaccine and you had one of these say South African strains, you would still um, have a chance, less likelihood have, of having a severe COVID reaction, correct? That is correct. So we feel the vaccines still protect you from the end game, which is the, which is the one that we all worry about. The end game is severe disease. And if you have severe disease, you could end up being on a ventilator. And if you are on a ventilator, your chances of not coming out of it are very high. You know, 40% or so people don't make it out of a ventilator. So what we want is, the vaccines to prevent you from getting to that stage, severe disease. And we feel at this point in time, all the vaccines out there on the market uh, protect most of the people against getting severe disease. They cannot, they do not protect 100% of the people, but they, they protect the majority of the people in the high percentages, in the 80, 85% plus region, they are protected from severe disease, which is a very good thing. We should celebrate this. And are you finding that all the vaccines that are currently out there are just as good as each other, or are there some that are better than each other? My, <laughs> Sheila. <laughs> I guess you can't really say that, right? <laughs> no, you're, take, you're taking me on a shopping trip to see which car <laughs> to buy. So my answer is, it will be lovely to find out uh, which one is a super duper turbocharged uh, vaccine. Time will tell, research will tell us. At this point in time, my advice would be, uh, they all work, uh, hand on heart, they all work, and they're all going to protect you and save your lives. Please don't go shopping for the vaccines. The first one that is offered to you, take it. It's very important that you are protected. It's very important that you don't go shopping because you think the Moderna one or the Pfizer one or the AstraZeneca one or the Sputnik V one are better. They all do the job. You see, we can't go shopping anymore because the shops are closed. So, hey, you know, we just wanted a little bit of excitement to see if we could go shopping for some vaccines. <laughs> That's true. Hmm. So um, as far as the vaccine and the, the doses, how important is it to get that second dose exactly um, the time that is they tell you? And the reason that we that I bring this up is here in the US, there is a concern that uh, the first batch are getting vaccinated and the second, uh, the second batch of people aren't getting vaccinated. So there's a worry that there might be a delay in getting that second dose. So as a practicing public health doctor and somebody who has done uh, a lot of ch pediatrics and I was also a GP before that. So my journey of being a clinician is long and varied. Um, I know I've been giving vaccines for years, decades. Uh, and 
uh, empirically talking and empirically working it out, the first dose induces immunity. It accelerates what naturally happens in biological systems anyway. The second dose boosts your immunity. So if I were to give the second dose later, uh, will it reduce my immunity? No. So very earlier on, I started promoting that in the middle of a crisis, what should the UK government do? And I said, well, uh, instead of using first dose followed by four weeks delay, second dose, take, the, take that a la carte of two doses per person and double it. Instead of giving it to one person followed by four weeks and that same person gets the second dose, increase the interval, all right? And that way you immunize twice as many people as fast as possible, as quickly as possible. And that way you save more lives. So the, the United Kingdom government taking that line off, immunize with one dose as fast as possible, as many as possible is a good idea. And giving you your second booster uh, three months later is not going to disrupt your immune system or your immune making uh, process. It's not going to give you suboptimal immunity or any of that concern. In fact, to prove my point, uh, I thought this, we thought this, many of us thought this empirically, but the research was then done and published in the Lancet recently that actually giving the vaccine at three months interval is not a bad thing at all. In fact, it is a good thing. So people who are worried that I should have received my vaccine at the three week interval, I'm now receiving it at three months interval, don't worry about it, it's good for you. Uh, finally, let me explain to you why when pharmaceutical companies, they make drugs and vaccines and other things, they make it to a formula, give it here and then interval and then give it here. It costs them a lot of money to also alter their data sheet to say you can give it at this point and you may also give it at the four month state or at the five month state, etc. It costs a lot of money and a lot of bureaucratic headaches to change that data sheet. So they say what they say when they say it but it doesn't mean that you are rigidly bound to, I must give the first dose here, followed by four week interval, and then here. Uh, you can vary it, which is what the UK government has done. But the only concern is obviously the second dose gives you the highest level of immunity, right? So it's a boost. So it's not a concern at all. So what it is, is when I give you the first dose, that is the magic. So after I have given you your first jab, your first vaccine, that's when the magic starts. And within three weeks of having received the first magic, your body has already started to make sufficient, make immune memory, et cetera. And when at the three month stage, I reintroduce that virus uh, signature into your system, I'm only giving your immune system another kicking to say, I'm back again. You better make some more immune memory and remember I'm the bad guy. That's all we're doing, you see? So we're boosting immune memory. Your protection starts three weeks after your first jab. How long does it, I mean, how long is that protection for? I mean, if, if you take your second dose like six months or eight months later, is that gonna, is it just gonna wean down because it hasn't had its booster? Yeah, it's a good, very good point. So I was asked this uh, recently and I said, well, okay, let's work this out. So, so say I was given my booster at four months instead of three months. Is it the end of the world? No, of course not. Uh, your body will still remember what was done to you four months ago. Uh, what if I was given it at five months? Uh, I think it will still work. What if it, I was given it at six months? I think it will still work. Of course, there becomes a law of diminishing uh, advantage uh, the longer I leave it. But 
uh, we don't really know. But if I was pushed into a corner and 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 said, doctor, if I got my second jab at six weeks, at six months, uh, what are the consequences? I would say minimal, right? Minimal, absolutely minimal. If I was given the second booster at uh, uh, two years interval, I might say maybe maybe your immune system uh, won't benefit from it as well as if it had been given earlier. So, so these are sort of theoretical debates and discussions, but the fact that I've delayed it by three months is clearly shown that it works. If you delayed it by four months, I'm willing to say, of course it will work. If you delayed it by five months, it will still work. I want people to feel reassured the delay in the second jab does not mean you've got a suboptimal immune response. And what about the mixing of vaccines? Because there's, um, you know, there's some studies now that are saying, you know, some people taking the Pfizer first and then the AstraZeneca one second is actually how it's, it's, it's better. Um, what's your take on that? Yeah, it might be better, actually. Who knows? But, you know, when I have been uh, struggling to get young surgeons to be um, zero convert against hepatitis B vaccine. Sometimes they have three, four, five of one brand of the hep B vaccine and they never zero convert. And then we used to tell them swap brands and let's see what happens. And when they swapped brands, lo and behold, they zero converted straight away. So uh, with respect to uh, say you received your Pfizer vaccine first, and now I've got to give you an AstraZeneca one, what are the consequences? Nil, zero, none. Look, we used the nanoparticles in the first instance to induce immunity. This time we're using a carrier virus to take the mRNA molecule into your cell to make the spike protein to express and then create immunity. So we're using a different pathway to get into your cell but to make the immune response, it's the same process. We are getting your ribosomes to interact with, your, with the RNA, messenger RNA, to make the spike protein. One was through a nanoparticle, the other was through a, a virus getting the molecule into your cell. No difference, no problem, it will work. Got it. Now the concern, out there is um, the age. There's uh, some countries that are very concerned about people above 65 um, taking the vaccine. Um, what are your concerns about that, Dr. Parrot? Yeah, Sheila, you're asking lovely questions today. I'm very <laughs> happy to be asked them and answer them for you too. So thank you for asking it. Um, these are lovely things that I love teaching my students. So here, here, here it is. So this is a case of splitting hairs, right? You know, this is neither party is wrong, but there's a lot of hair splitting and the media love to see the divide and they like to make it look like it is the Grand Canyon of a divide. It isn't, here goes. So empirically speaking, meaning, you know, working it out from first principles and theor theory, et cetera. The UK government says, the UK regulator, not the government, the regulator says, uh, on balance of probabilities and biology and how these things work, we expect it to work in the older age group as well. Whilst in the emergency of developing the vaccine and bringing the vaccine to the market, the AstraZeneca people could not do extensive trials in the older age group to see that it truly worked. But we feel on balance of probabilities and biology and how it's working that it will work. So, so the regulator, the MHRA says, yes, I, regu I, I say yes, go for it. The European uh, governments individually say, we haven't seen the evidence that it works. Therefore, we're not going to use it. Neither are wrong. It is a question of semantics. So absence of evidence is not evidence that it doesn't work. It's just that the evidence is absent. 
but it's not that the evidence says it doesn't work. It's absence of evidence. So because of the absence of evidence, but biological plausibility, the UK regulator said, use it. Some European regulators said there is absence of evidence. So we are hesitant to use it. The European Medicine Agency did say that it will work. So we've got individual European nations saying, we don't know. If I may, if I were to make my own conclusion about this mess of mixed messaging, I think it is manipulation by politicians to cover their backs for shortages of the vaccine. So it's easy to say, isn't it? It doesn't work anyway. The truth is you haven't got the vaccine, so you don't want your people to be angry with you. So one way to stop them being angry with you is to say it doesn't really work anyway. Do you see, do you see the nuance? And I think that's at play here because I saw it at play when there was a shortage of masks. The narrative was, we don't know if masks work. Deep down, I felt actually you didn't really have the masks and that's why you were not keen to promote mask wearing. Wow, thank you for that little insight there. <laughs> so um, the concern I have is a lot of the elderly population, they get their vaccine, they get the second booster dose and then they, they start feeling comfortable. They feel that, oh, you know, we're, we're protected. Is there a way of testing antibodies after you've had a vaccine done to see that you actually have immunity? Yeah, but I wouldn't go down that path and um, it's not a precise test. So that's the first item. It's not a precise test. And because it's not a precise test, uh, it's a meaningless test. In other words, if I were to take a blood sample from from yourself, myself, others, and find no antibodies in there. Does it mean I'm not immune? Does it mean I am immune, but I didn't find the antibodies? We don't know. We haven't got a precise test, which tells us you are immune because I took this test and I found this marker inside your blood to tell me you're definitely immune. So it's an imprecise test. It's a test that has never been developed. So we don't know. Now, look, this is, this is why I'm saying it like this. When I inject you with the spike protein to induce immunity, there is a surge in uh, antibodies. And that surge goes up. And then over the process of time, that antibody levels drop. That's how normal things work. But just because it has dropped does not mean you're not immune because you'd have almost undetectable antibody levels. But the moment the virus enters your system, your body's B cells and T cells wake up, they stir into actions and shoot the antibody levels to high levels to fight this new invader very, very quickly. And that's how it works. So your body doesn't make antibodies for free, just hanging around there doing nothing. So that's why we don't have a test. Got it. And what about the people that have already had COVID-19? Um, and then, so they say some of these people, they, they're pretty sure they had COVID, then they do the antibody test and then they, they don't have the antibodies. Do they have a different level of immunity that is just not being detected based on what you're saying? No. They, with the passage of time, antibody levels will drop, but that doesn't mean they are not, not immune. Uh, we would expect them to remain immune. How long for, we don't know. But uh, my advice to people who've had COVID is you should still be immunized because the, the vaccine will stimulate your immune system and prime it to be in a prime condition in case you were to encounter the virus again. So if you had COVID, uh, please get vaccinated. And if you've had COVID and you've had an antibody test and the antibody levels were so low, uh, therefore you think you're not immune, that's not true. There is no reliable test to tell us that you are immune or not immune after your infection or after your immunization. 
Well, thank you for clarifying that. This has been a really great conversation because you're answering so many questions that so many people have out there. Um, now, as far as the, um, there are some people that have been recommended to not take the vaccine because of some autoimmune conditions that they have. Now, what are the options for, for those uh, people? So there are very few people to whom I would say, uh, don't take this or that. Let me start with that. So if you have severe extensive allergies to a number of things, then we recommend that you don't take the Pfizer vaccine, okay? So if you have severe extensive allergies to a number of items, so it would be something like this, pollen, nuts, sesame seeds, bee stings, other allergens, lots and lots of extensive, severe, extensive allergies, number one, extensive allergies meaning number of items, and number two, a, a extensive serious reaction, like an anaphylactic type reaction if you were introduced to these peanuts, sesame oil, bee sting, etc. then we say, don't take the Pfizer vaccine, but take the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine instead. It's not a case of don't be immunized, okay? I must rest, lay this to rest. Don't take the Pfizer vaccine, you can take the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, job done. Second point, do I really, really know of a group of people who should not be vaccinated at all? No. I think these vaccines are good for most people, if not all people. So this is again, wonderful, wonderful new vaccines that have been developed on modern, fancy, clever platforms, whereby I feel as far as my knowledge goes, most people, all people can benefit from this vaccine. I do not know of any group of people who should not take it. One more thing, of course I know that in some groups of people, the vaccine may not be as effective, but that is not the same as don't take it. The simple answer to members of the public is you take it, knowing full well that in some people, the vaccine may not produce a good immune response. That's different to don't take it. That makes a lot of sense. Now, what is the future of vaccines at this point? Do you see that they're going to get more effective? Do you feel like there's better one, like better vaccines coming out? What do you feel? The future is very bright. The future is brilliant, and uh, it's a marvel of science. So, because of antibiotic abuse, we are feeding antibiotics to animals to fatten them faster for the market. We're using antibiotics as food. It is a disgrace. And it's a disgrace upon politicians the world over for not stopping this as soon as they could have, should have, must have. They've failed to do this. As a result, uh, we may not be able to do your hip transplant uh, or your knee joint replacement or your aortic aneurysm or your serious abdominal surgery, et cetera, et cetera, when we get Antibiotics do not work anymore. And antibiotics do not work anymore because you've been feeding antibiotics to animals to fatten them up faster so that you make more profit. It's a shame. Uh, we need to address this urgently today. So we may be able to make vaccines against these bacterial infections where the antibiotics have stopped working. So that will be a new phenomena, a lifesaver. So when we have multi-drug resistant bacteria against which we have no antibiotics that work, it may just be possible to make vaccines that do the job instead. Second bit, uh, we may be able to make vaccines that are bespoke 
for your cancer. So, so say you have a cancer and then we make a bespoke mRNA vaccine to boost your immunity against that cancer growth. So instead of shoving lots of um, anti-cancer drugs to a cancer patient to kill the tumor, we, we, we give you a vaccine which then boosts your immune system to attack the tumor and kill the tumor. So that is a new development, cancer therapy via vaccines. I look forward to those developments. Uh, the, the marvel of getting a sample of your tumor, making a bespoke mRNA vaccine for your cancer therapy, giving it back to you, getting your immune system, not, not chemicals, not medicines, your immune system to fight the tumor off and, and control it or kill it is a marvel. This is wonderful times. Wow, that's a quite exciting development that's coming up, coming out. It's good. It's very good. Now, with the vaccine coming out, can you just reiterate why it's important that people still wear their masks? Yeah, it's again, very good question, Sheila. I love you. <laughs> You're good, you are. So, um, with the immunization, we are protecting you from severe illness. In some cases, you will get mild infection, an infection that makes you either asymptomatic or symptomatic. And if you are infected, you are also infectious. So if you are infectious, you could go on to infect other people who have not been immunized. And if they get the infection, they could get severe illness and die. And therefore, it is important that we keep the case numbers down by saying, I have got my vaccine protection, but I may have a mild illness and I might go on to infect other people. And also it is in your self-interest. The self-interest goes as follows. If we don't all behave, and suppress infection globally, then these variants will keep on emerging. And if the variants keep on emerging, one of these variants could come out which knocks everything out and we are back to square one. So it is in everyone's self-interest to keep case numbers down, both for the vaccinated people and the unvaccinated people. Wow, that is... Just great advice. Let's spend some time, Dr. Bharat, talking about transmission again. Um, it, even though it's almost a year of having COVID-19 out there, I still see people doing silly things and wearing their mask underneath their nose. I still see touching the faces, not the adequate hand washing. Let's just go through the steps again. Um, I know we've done this a few times, but I just feel like we, we just need to keep keep re-emphasizing it. Let's go through the, the how important it is to keep safe and some safety precautions that we can take. Yeah, so Sheila, um, the Japanese came up with this simple thing and it's so beautiful. It's avoid the three Cs. So avoid getting close to other human beings. That's one of the Cs. Avoid crowds and avoid closed spaces. So closed means indoor places with poor ventilation, avoid it. Avoid your crowded buses, tubes, and trains. Avoid your restaurants, etc. That's your crowded, crowded places. And then avoid getting close to other people, uh, other people who are not part of your circle. So if you practice those three Cs, you're on to a winner. The second bit is uh, modes of transmission. We need to accept and admit that we were wrong. It's always good to say, actually, were we wrong or was it a case of we didn't really know? Uh, maybe it's a bit of both. So the bit of both is, I think there is considerable aerosol transmission of this virus. We started off with, it is um, droplet spread and 
dirty surfaces with which you can introduce the infection to your nose and mouth. So modes of transmission are now, as of current knowledge, your dirty hand introducing it to your mouth and nose, one. Second point, droplets from myself infecting you. So if you are next to me and we are in an animated long conversation, um, I could be sending you some droplets which will infect you. The third bit that we never addressed properly is I could be in this room, have a big sneeze, a big cough or whatever, and leave an area suspended, uh, a volume of air suspended with my virus particles. And then you walk into the room. I've gone, I'm not in the room. You walk into the room, you say, well, there's nobody here in the room, but I was there 20 minutes ago, yeah? So you walk into the room, you inhale the air, you get infected. That's your aerosol transmission. So because aerosol transmission is a big component of getting infected, this is why I emphasize avoid closed spaces where there are too many humans coming and going or already present. Open your windows, dilute the number of virus particles that are circulating in that indoor space so that if you were to get hit, you only get hit by a fewer number and therefore you don't get infected. So, so this aerosol business is so important. I must emphasize that you wear your mask, you wear a good quality mask. You might even have to wear two masks now that these variants are more infectious. But please, my advice is, buy a good quality mask, a very good quality mask. And second point, wear it properly. It's so important. I want to demonstrate this to you. So you, you take these things, okay, nice and clean, right? You know, do have clean masks, it's important. Now then watch me, please. This is really important. Don't go here, please don't go here. This is ridiculous. Definitely not here, but don't go here. Watch, please go to the top of your nose and you press that metal thing that's inside the mask to mold it against your nose. Now watch what has happened, All right? It's molded and it's molded high up here and then hold it here like this and pull it down. So it's nice and tight and snug fitting. You can even put surgical tape here if you wear glasses to stop them steaming up. You see, this is the way to wear it properly. And you really must wear your mask properly. Otherwise, you're only cheating yourself. You're making yourself vulnerable to wearing your mask like this. Do you see how the steam is coming out, right? <laughs> If it is coming out from me, it can also come from other people and find your nose and it will infect you. So don't wear a symbolic mask because it will infect you. Then what? So wear it properly. Stop those little particles getting to your nose and mouth. It is in your interest. Thank you for that demonstration. Yeah, you're right. And also a lot of people, they'll touch their mask that's been out you know, the virus is out there, it goes onto your mask and then they touch it and they take it out like this. Remember when you're taking it off, you have to take it off from the side and don't touch the surface of the mask yes. because then if you touch it, it's now on your hands and then you touch your face. Indeed, indeed. Thank you for that, Sheila. Thank you. Do, are you finding um, now that the, the, the COVID-19 has been out for so long that there's more information about how long it is suspended in the air? So for example, if someone walks in and does sneeze or coughs, in, in the air and then you walk in. How long do we think it stays um, airborne? Uh, there are various um, learned journal publications on this matter and it can range to, you know, from a, a few minutes to up to three hours. So this idea of it being floating in the air, invisible but present, 
has to be taken seriously and it could be up to three hours, which is quite serious really, you know. So uh, there's, there's plenty of literature. Uh, people can look it up in, in learned journals, uh, different studies report different times. Three hours seems like a really long, that's a huge amount of time. I, I mean, that's, that means that it's, it, it must be very contagious if you've got three hours of just sitting in the air. Now, we, we also out. think it's an element of resuspension. That's the other thing that we need to bear in mind that, you know, it lands on a surface and then there is turbulence and then there is drying out. And as it dries out, the heavy droplet that dries out becomes the new droplet that is now airborne. So, you know, this is simple physics, which we were sort of switched off to. We switched our brains off to a heavy droplet falls down fine, but a heavy droplet can become a small droplet as it dries out. And as it dries out, and it's now become a tiny droplet, it can become airborne. It can be resuspended into air. Basic fundamental biology and physics and aerodynamics. Which also is a concern if it's landed somewhere and then you wipe that surface down thinking you're cleaning it, if you're not wiping it correctly, you could make it airborne again. Correct, correct, correct. And I feel very sorry for uh, people who are on very low wage, minimum wage, poorly trained, poorly equipped, poor PP, I'm referring to cleaners and, and people who maintain these buildings and things. They should get the best PPE, et cetera, to protect them, poor people. You know, I feel very sorry we don't treat our workers with dignity and care and sympathy and care that we, we really need to give to fellow human beings. They should be given good PPE and good wages and given good instructions on don't, you know, don't generate the aerosol, uh, go in there, damp it down and then wipe the surface clean. And then we teach them, I'm, I'm privileged to be working in several places where uh, I, I teach how to don, meaning put on your, uh, PPE and doff, meaning uh, take it off, but take it off in a clever way like you demonstrated so that you don't pose a risk to yourself or to others. So the general public that don't have the, uh, the proper PPE, for example, the N95s, which have been proven to be quite effective, um, they are saying, like you mentioned, the double masking, but the double masking still has to be two good quality masks. Elaborate a little bit about what makes a mask good quality. So, what we need is a mask that is going to fit snug over your nose, under your chin, and it is tight fitting, number one. Number two, it has to have a water repellent outer layer. So, the outer fabric is tight weave, in other words, small, tiny, tiny, tiny pores, and it holds them. So, in other words, um, it doesn't sort of lose its efficacy after six hours use. So it's water repellent fabric on the outside with tiny pores. On the inner surface, it's an absorbent layer and then a final outer layer, which is a so it's three layers now, an outer layer, which is also absorbent. So if you look at this, this is a water repellent outer layer, tight weave. Then inside here, is a absorbent layer. And then inside this layer is another layer, which is also absorbent. So you need at least a three layered, two layers on the inside absorbent and an outer layer, which is water repellent and a tight weave. Any particular materials that we, for these homemade masks that are good? I prof personally prefer we need to move away from the homemade masks because the risks are people don't understand the difference between a tight weave fabric, a water repellent fabric and an ordinary fabric. So now I wish to say it is better you buy something that is certified uh, and, and, and it's not that expensive, but certified that it is properly made mask. I'm sorry to have to say this, but I think it is better to move people to go and buy a good quality mask. Got it. So we have uh, quite a few questions that have come in. Um, so one of the questions is, um, is it still safe to go outdoors without a mask? So I've changed my advice on 
uh, going outdoors with or without a mask? And my answer would be as follows. If you were to walk out of your front door and go out in the woods and there's hardly anybody there, fine, no problem. If you were to go out of your front door and go to your high street, where there is a few hundred people down your high street and you will be passing people almost every 10 meters or so as you walk by, wear a mask, definitely. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I've had to change my thinking, but now that we've got a new variant which is more infectious, so if I was in an outdoor place with lots of humans present, wear a mask. So based on uh, your comment about outdoor um, transmission, how, how long do you think that the virus stays suspended outdoors if somebody coughs and sneezes? I think it's, it's not a question of it stays, but it's a question of it um, uh, like dissipating. It's, yeah, so, so, so the good thing is that there is considerable quick dilution of uh, the virus particles that anyone secretes outdoors. Therefore, outdoors is a very safe environment. The trouble is when I am passing by other people in an outdoor arena, I could unfortunately catch their shower of millions of virus particles being secreted. So as I walk past somebody, uh, they may be shedding trillions of virus particles and I would be unlucky to catch it and then get infected. So it's a case of, as I walk past you or I stop by you for a few minutes, uh, I may get hit. That's the issue. So again, it's, it's back to that viral load, like how much they're taking it. And we still don't know what the amount of viral load, load someone needs to be infected. Some people no. could be a few particles, some people, people could be a lot more, is that correct? Yes, indeed, depending on your vulnerability, et cetera. But the basic rule of thumb would be the greater the viral load, the greater the probability of getting severe disease. And the interesting thing is uh, globally now that they're doing so much research on all, like even the genetic component, like some people have, have more predisposition to getting severe COVID than others because of their genetic component. So I guess time will tell, we'll be getting more data, more information. I mean, we've already seen so much information and literature coming out in the last couple of months. Yes, so I, don't think there is the big genetic element. I think there is a big element of human factors that make you at greater risk of severe illness. One of the human factors is poverty. So if you are poor, the sequence of events that happens to poor people makes them more likely to get infected and then severe illness and problems. Let me elucidate more. So if you are in a uh, uh, poor occupation or poor circumstances, uh, you're more likely to work in more at-risk jobs. The bus driver, the taxi driver, the chef, the cook, the cleaner, um, the person working in public places, the shopkeeper, the shop assistant, all of those people regularly exposed to other humans infecting them. And then when they go home, they will also have their brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, etc., also in similar occupations, all coming home, bringing their risks back home. And then in that home, smaller home, there's a greater chance of them getting infected. Uh, then the other reason is that uh, when you are poor, you also have poverty of uh, nutrition and diet and and all those other things. So if you have conditions like diabetes, blood pressure, heart disease, et cetera, your chances of severe illness if you got infected increase. So it's all those items that target, for example, in the UK, the black Asian uh, minority ethnic uh, group of people. The bottom line is poverty. Poverty is the killer. And it is a failure of um, government to gaslight on the one hand, we have a problem with BAME people, but on the other hand, not to say, well, actually the bigger problem is poverty. 
right? And take that thing, it's not only BAME people, but it is all people, all people who are in poor circumstances or poverty are at greater risk of infection and severe illness. Absolutely. How do you explain, Dr. Barrett, sometimes there's um, like there's these cases where you have a whole family and someone's infected, comes in, spending time with the rest of the family members, they're eating, staying together, but then some members don't get infected and some do. Yeah, you know, it's a conundrum and it's a lovely question of you to ask again. Um, and it really is a conundrum. Um, we, we don't know is because I've come across this and difficult to explain. Could there be uh, some sort of, you know, you are, you, are, you are together, but you're not together? Uh, or could it be that uh, other people who are not part of your group are easier to infect you by? And I think there's both of those at play here, which is within your own group. So we've got husbands and wives together. Husband is infected and by amazing uh, observation, the wife doesn't get infected. How come? On the other hand, uh, the visitor comes into the home and he manages to infect the whole home. Why that? Uh, there's a lot to learn. Yeah, I, I've noticed that with my patients. So, I, you know, that's why I thought maybe there was a genetic component that we just didn't really know about. Um, so we have a couple more questions, uh, which is, Dr. Bharat, um, does steam help if somebody has COVID, steam inhalations? So we have no scientific proof that it helps. That's the answer. Having said that, if you think about it, it's a mechanical process whereby there's lots and lots of secretions, your airways are blocked, it's blocked by mucus and secretions and so on. So my answer to you would be as follows. No evidence that steam helps. On the other hand, if you feel subjective, feel good, you feel better after inhaling some steam and some vapors and, and all those things, be my guest. You know, I'm not here to be restrictive and say, don't do it, etc. cetera. Uh, I don't think there is any evidence of harm. Otherwise I would have said, don't do it. So, but I have no evidence that it helps but I have knowledge that people feel better by having used it. And I say, if it makes you better, be my guest. Got it. The other question we have um, from our global audience out here, we have um, a question on selenium and vitamin D. How effective is it in helping with COVID? Yeah, so we've, it's a lovely question. We've not got evidence that, um, it's the vitamin D deficiency that causes you to have poor outcomes. But what we do know is that you do need good vitamin D levels to maintain good overall immune responses to a range of infections and illnesses. So it's a case of you should always be topped up with all your vitamins and things uh, to maintain good general health. Therefore, make sure you are either eating well having enough exposure to sunlight or taking supplements. But am I saying that you need to take supplements so that it protects you against COVID? That's different. I haven't got that evidence. So this applies to both your vitamin D and your zinc and your vitamin C and your selenium. Now, selenium is very interesting. I've always been interested in selenium and um, selenium gives me a pointer to your diet should be as varied as possible. It should be of um, greens, um, vegetables, uh, berries, nuts, ferment, and a little bit of protein. And if you had all of those big variety of diet, you will pick up your selenium that way. Uh, Brazil nuts are very good in selenium. And I'm not asking you to eat Brazil nuts every day, but if that was a part of your regular intake um, every few weeks, et cetera, it will do you good. 
Well, thank you for clarifying that. Um, this was such an am amazing session. We could probably talk for hours and hours and there's always so many questions coming in. So hopefully you'll be coming back again and having another session and giving us another update soon. Thank, thank you. you. And, I'm, and I know we're gonna be, every, literally every time I, I switch on the television, you're on one of the channels, CNN, BBC. So we'll be seeing you quite regularly. How many interviews have you done so far, Dr. Bharat? Do you, do you have an idea? I think it is over uh, 15,000 interviews in one year, and that equates to many interviews per day. And to be truthful, uh, it is my pleasure to serve humanity because uh, I do it for free. We don't get a fee for this. It's not, it, it's not done because I'm getting paid. I do it. I do it from the warmth of my heart because I feel I have a message to give to all of humanity to keep safe. Let's make the world a better place. Thank you. And thank you for, for all the great work that you do. And it's been an honor to have you on our show. And, and we look forward to hearing from you again um, in a couple of weeks where you can give us some more update and some wonderful advice like you did today. Thank you, Dr. Bart. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you.